information. Medical research is exposing the causal links. For example, one study finds that early repeated activation of the body's stress system actually alters brain chemistry. A consequence is that adults who have experienced early trauma often show increased aggression, impulsive behavior, and weakened cognition. Third, from countless sources in the literature, but also from personal observation and common sense, we know that severely distressed neighborhoods with poverty levels of 30 and 40 percent are places where stress and trauma are pervasive. Next slide. We know, therefore, don't we, that high ACE scores are likely to be accumulated not only within households, the focus of the ACE study, but also within the geography of concentrated poverty. What's the significance of these three points? A high A score is not just a number. Acers, as they are called, with a score of four or above, are more than twice as likely as those with a score of zero to have heart or lung disease in adulthood, over four times more likely to suffer depression. A male child with an A score of six is 46 times more likely than one with a zero score to use drugs intravenously as an adult. Acers with a score of six or more die on average two decades earlier than those with zero scores. Next. So statistically speaking, children growing up in severely distressed neighborhoods are at risk of blighted adulthoods. Hundreds of studies, writes William Julius Wilson, suggests that concentrated poverty increases the likelihood of joblessness, dropping out of school, lower educational achievement, involvement in crime, and so on. That, of course, is from an academic. Another writer, not an academic, James Baldwin, writing around the 100th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation, tells his nephew and namesake that he has been, quote, set down in a ghetto, born into a society in which your countrymen have destroyed and are destroying hundreds of thousands of lives. Only a few years after those words were written, in the summer of 1967, the country's residential segregation practices came home to roost. African-American neighborhoods in Newark, Detroit, and other cities exploded. Police and National Guardsmen were able to quell the riots only after scores of deaths and the leveling of entire city blocks. President Johnson appointed a commission to determine why it had happened and what could be done to prevent a, re a repetition. On March 1, 1968, answers were proffered by the Kerner Commission, as it came to be known. Our nation is moving toward two societies one black, one white, separate and unequal. Segregation and poverty have created in the racial ghetto a distinctive environment unknown to most white Americans. Federal housing programs must be given a new thrust aimed at overcoming the prevailing patterns of racial segregation. I suggest that a particular HUD program, Housing Choice Vouchers, is one of the most obvious overcoming tools at hand. Why on earth aren't vouchers being used to get children out of concentrated poverty urban neighborhoods? Years ago, Gary Orfield said, get them out of the ghetto. This is the most powerful way. Nicholas Lemon exercises or echoes Orfield. For the ghetto kid, he says, 99% of the time making it goes with getting out of the ghetto. Brent Staples devoting one of his New York Times columns to what he calls butchery in our ghettos asks us to remember how Britons shipped their children out of London during the Blitz. What American cities need, Staples writes, are evacuation plans to spirit at least some black boys out of harm's way before it's too late. But the voucher program has not been getting African American children out of the ghetto. Almost, one might say, the contrary. A dissertation by Molly Metzger at Northwestern University includes a comprehensive look at HCV studies. Her findings? The HCV program has resulted in greater, not less, racial and economic segregation. 
voucher households are more segregated than a voucher eligible comparison group. Metzger's disheartening conclusion is that the voucher program has reinforced patterns of racial and economic segregation. One chapter of her dissertation is entitled The Reconcentration of Poverty Through Housing Vouchers. HUD's own data show that twice as many white as minority voucher families move to low poverty areas, while three times as many minority families move to high poverty neighborhoods. Why should this be? Why should a program, one of whose goals is to deconcentrate, do the opposite? I believe there are five major reasons, two conceptual, so to speak, three programmatic. The first reason is the moving to opportunity demonstration. MTO was not just a bump in the road. It was a dagger pointed at the heart of housing mobility. MTO, Robert Sampson writes, cast doubt on the general thesis that neighborhoods matter in the lives of poor individuals. The thesis that is, of course, the bedrock upon which housing mobility rests. Why undertake the challenges of helping children escape severely distressed neighborhoods if moving to better neighborhoods doesn't matter. Yet we now know that MTO does not show that mobility doesn't work or that moving to better neighborhoods doesn't matter. Serious problems with the design of MTO led William Julius Wilson to conclude that MTO, quote, tells us little about the effect of neighborhood on the development of children and families. Two recent landmark studies by Robert Sampson and Patrick Sharkey, respectively, show that neighborhoods do matter a great deal in the lives of individuals, indeed across generations. So if MTO was ever thought to be a reason for not using vouchers to spirit kids out of harm's way, that reason cannot survive the ACE study, the medical research, the serious problems with MTO, and the studies by Sampson and Sharkey. The second conceptual reason is that the in the persisting debate between so-called place-based strategies and mobility, public policy has consistently privileged the former and ignored the latter. The fact is, however, that in our 50-year track record of trying to revitalize concentrated poverty neighborhoods is extremely disappointing. In any event, as Sharkey, a proponent of place-based initiatives rightly says, sound policy will employ both approaches. The first of the three programmatic reasons has been the inertia of adhering to the familiar way of doing voucher business. Every voucher administrator should be required to read Segregating Shelter by Stephanie DeLuca and colleagues. This study makes clear how cruelly ironic for minority families is the middle word in the designation housing choice vouchers. It explains why it is that under typical voucher rules, so few minority families acquire housing in middle class neighborhoods, and so many wind up in high poverty segregated ones. The explanation is not rocket science. Instead of being user friendly, portability is all but impossible for many families to navigate. Instead of providing incentives to PHAs to foster mobility, HUD privileges quick lease-up over good location. Instead of FMRs that facilitate mobility, HUD uses a metro-wide arrangement that makes it more difficult. HUD tolerates search time limits that often lead families to take the first unit they can find, and landlord lists that are heavily weighted with properties in high-poverty segregated neighborhoods. HUD's administrative payments policy does not reward mobility, and so on. One cannot but conclude that HUD is content with a system that not only fails to support minority families who desire to relocate to non-poor, non-segregated neighborhoods, but one that actually frustrates that desire. The second programmatic reason we haven't used vouchers to get children out of harm's way is that HUD fails to require that effective mobility assistance be offered post as well as pre-move. Yet, as segregating shelter explains, the absence of effective search, housing search assistance virtually ensures that minority families will not seek out housing in middle-class neighborhoods. 
The final reason is that mobility costs money. And in a zero-sum game, that means fewer families housed. But who ever imagined that fair housing would not cost money? How about the costs of blighted adulthood? And in the analogous Hope 6 context, HUD has deliberately and rightly chosen to privilege escape from concentrated poverty over housing more families. So here are five reasons that help explain why, as Molly Metzger says, the voucher program has reinforced, not broken, patterns of segregation. But none of the explanations amount to justifications. If we have a way to get children out of harm's way, is it not a moral imperative to restructure the voucher program to that end? There are, of course, many families who, for understandable reasons, can't or won't take advantage of a mobility opportunity. But for the non-negligible number who do desire to get their children into safer neighborhoods and better schools, there is, I submit, an unanswerable moral case for making that realistically possible. Can it be done? Of course it can. Even as we speak, the Thompson program in Baltimore is enabling minority families not only to move from central city Baltimore to surrounding counties, but to stay there, demonstrating what good pre- and post-move mobility assistance can accomplish. It is also seeking to enlist the Baltimore Housing Authority in a plan to offer targeted vouchers and mobility assistance to all families with children under age eight living in high poverty neighborhoods in Baltimore. Why should HUD not set aside a portion of its vouchers nationally for what I will call Thompson-style initiatives, target them for use in true opportunity areas, prioritize them for families with young children living in the concentrated poverty census tracts of urban America, streamline, that is regionalize administration, provide participants with comprehensive assistance post as well as pre-move, revise voucher rules and CMAP to deal with the barriers to mobility so poignantly described in segregating shelter, realistically enable those parents who wish to do so to spirit their children out of harm's way. Why shouldn't a portion of our vouchers, these scarce societal resources, be set aside for use in this life-saving way? So I put it to you that given what we now know, there is no excuse for not making it happen. If we do not, we will continue to be complicit in the language of James Baldwin in the ongoing destruction of hundreds of thousands of lives that, I believe, can fairly be called a moral imperative. Can we expect HUD to respond to this imperative? I'm sorry to say that I don't believe we can. That leaves legislation and litigation. Under present circumstances, the former is not likely. But what about the latter? Isn't HUD's current method of doing voucher business a grievous flouting of its duty to affirmatively further fair housing? Don't HUD's own data show that current voucher rules do not bring fair housing to minority families? Isn't NAFA in the business of seeing to it that the Fair Housing Act is complied with? So here's a job for NAFA. Form a litigation task force around this issue. Craft and file the lawsuit against HUD that is crying to be filed. To the moral imperative upon which HUD is turning a blind eye, let NAFA respond in this forthright way. Thank you for listening. And I'm happy to turn it over to Chris Klepper. Uh, well, thank you very much, Alex. Um, uh, Alex is always a hard act to follow, given that he's the father of mobility, uh, given the control litigation. Uh, but while we all consider Alex's uh, challenge just issued, uh, for the near future of the voucher program. Uh, let's look at where we are now on the ground. Um, I thought we'd start by reminding ourselves of the good things that came out of the Gautreaux litigation and the assisted housing program that it created in the mid-70s. Uh, it ran for 25 years 
It moved 7,500 public housing families who enrolled in the program. It was regional in scope. It used targeted vouchers. And it introduced individual mobility counseling to help families move to areas with less crime and better schools. About half of those families moved to white suburbia. Um, so those were the real pioneer moves in the Chicagoland area. I worked on the Gautreau program myself at two different points in my life, in the mid-70s and later in the mid-90s, although I know I'm dating myself by saying that. Uh, I did learn so much from that experience. Um, a book was written about the Gautreau experience. Um, if we could go back to the last slide. I wasn't quite done. Good, thank you. Um, a book was written, Crossing the Color or the Class and Color Lines. Um, and it talked about a study done by Northwestern University professors on Gautreau. It found that 20 years later, movers to white suburbia in particular saw significant benefits. More children graduated from high school and went on to college. More children were working and had higher incomes. And it found that 75% of those families were still in opportunity areas all those years later. Um, next slide. Uh, Alex talked a little bit about MTO. And I'd like to give everyone a little ammunition when MTO comes up in any conversation around mobility. Uh, MTO hasn't been all that helpful to our cause. Um, so you need some things that you can say about it uh, and remember about MTO. Um, when the first evaluations were done, um, significant health benefits were found. And that was a surprise to everyone. We all expected better educational results, um, better employment results, those kinds of things, but not better health outcomes. So that was a, a really astonishing uh, finding. Um, but MTO didn't find those educational and employment improvements that we thought were there. Um, so we had some mixed results. But because the findings of MTO didn't really jibe with those from the Gautreau program, researchers started to look more closely at MTO. And as Alex said, they found problems in the program design. MTO families didn't move very far. They didn't stay very long. And often, children didn't even change schools. So the Urban Institute, Marjorie Austin Turner in particular, have looked much more closely at the findings of MTO. And they're, they found a lot of nuanced benefits. For example, MTO families that lived longer in low poverty areas did achieve better outcomes in work and school. So when you put it all together, adults had higher household earnings, and adults and children both had significantly better health outcomes, like less anxiety and depression, diabetes, obesity, and overall much better mental health. And boys and girls both had higher math and English scores and higher rates of college enrollment. So um, the, the results, really, if you dig into them, are really very good. Um, now, what do we do with that information? What have we learned since MTO and GATRO? Um, how do we move the ball forward as we think about several strategies that can reduce intergenerational poverty? So HCP, the agency I work for, runs a mobility program for the Chicago Housing Authority. The program is voluntary on the part of the CHA. It's not the result of litigation. And it's voluntary in terms of its participants. Um, folks can sign up for the program if they choose to or not. Um, this program is citywide. It's not regional. And we've moved about 1,100 households to areas with lower crime and better schools over the last almost four years. 
uh, they moved from areas averaging 32% poverty pre-move, um, which is twice the poverty rate for the city of Chicago, to areas averaging 13% poverty post-move, and that's about three points below the average. Um, the map on this slide shows the city of Chicago by its community areas, and the base map shows uh, the higher crime areas in the red, orange color, and uh, the lighter colors are the lower crime areas. Um, so we use this map when we're, we're uh, talking to our participants and an orientation that we provide to them. And our clients are mostly motivated by schools, better schools, and lower crime. So this map gives folks a pretty good uh, notion about the areas that they might want to consider. Um, the dots and the small type that you see there, because uh, the slide is a little small, it shows where the higher performing schools are located. And those are neighborhood schools so that um, uh, if families move within the boundaries of those particular schools, their child will go to that school. Chicago has a fairly complicated uh, school system, including magnet schools and charters and all of that. So um, this focuses on the better neighborhood schools. Um, next slide, please. Um, we also administer a regional program with nine public housing authorities throughout the region. HUD funded this program, and it's designed to help inform HUD's public policy on these issues, which is very encouraging that they want to know the answers to some of these questions. Um, the regional program is also a voluntary effort, um, and it includes several strategies. It's a regional mobility program, but we've also looked at streamlining portability and at uh, using project-based vouchers um, to expand opportunity and housing choice. So the map on this slide shows the opportunity areas in the Chicagoland region. The opportunity areas are in orange. Um, the map, uh, the area over by the, uh, what represents Lake Michigan there, the blue, um, is the city of Chicago. If you could put the arrow down just a little bit. There, that's the city of Chicago. And then uh, if we go outward, we get suburban Cook County. And then to the south, we have Will County, West DuPage County, and north, we have McHenry and Lake County. So it's a truly regional program. Um, we've defined opportunity areas. and. Um, and, and got an agreement from all of the housing authorities. In part of this program, we've taken a look at schools, really tracking schools that kids move from and move to. And we found that um, pre-move, children are attending schools that rank an average of a four, a four out of 10 on greatschools.org. And they're moving to areas with higher performing schools. They're moving to schools that average a 7 out of a 10. So they're, they're going from a 4 to a 7. And I think we sort of know that intuitively as we think about this. But here we have some actual results and some actual numbers. So I think um, that's moving the ball forward on that level. Um, there are other programs like Baltimore and Dallas um, that are litigation driven. They have, have even more impressive statistics. Um, so what do we do with our successful strategy? And it is only one strategy. It's not for everyone. But we have some great chances right now as fair housing advocates to begin to replicate these programs. So. Here are some of the opportunities that I think we have right now. Um, the new Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing Rule is a milestone. I think we've all waited for a very long time for that. 
Um, mobility programs are affirmatively fa furthering fair housing. We're outreaching to those least likely to apply for housing in opportunity areas, and we're making them feel welcome to apply for those choices. The voucher program is the vehicle that makes those areas affordable. Um, plus, the voucher program's goal um, is to promote racial and economic diversity. So it's a perfect vehicle. Um, other vehicles don't work as well, but that one certainly um, does work well. Um, so mobility is also a strategy um, to resolve uh, HUD fair housing complaints or litigation. Uh, we helped Rockford, Illinois, the housing authority there, through a consulting relationship to develop a mobility program that was the result of litigation, um, a previous relocation effort they had uh, used or they had implemented there, provided no fair housing choice for the residents who had to move, so litigation ensued and a mobility program became part of the resolution of that case. Um, we consulted with Rockford, but they actually did the program on the ground. Um, and besides litigation, PHAs are also using relocation strategies to develop mixed income housing, tearing down uh, old neglected public housing and developing new mixed income housing usually involving at least temporary relocation, if not the choice to use a voucher. Um, so that's another opportunity for mobility, and, and we did that in Port Arthur, Texas recently, um, again through a consulting relationship where they implemented the program, but we sort of taught them and helped them um, develop that program and work with them um, right through the very end. Um, regional planning and entitlement jurisdictions, they're going to have to do affirmatively furthering fair housing as well with the new rule. So there's another opportunity for advocates um, to um, discuss mobility programs and similar efforts to open more opportunities. Um, there are more programs now. You're going to hear you are from... Hello? Um, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, sorry. This is um, Rachel from NCI calling to do captioning. I'm sorry. I didn't know it actually called. I'm just going to the website I got a link to. Oh, okay. So I should just continue, right? <laughs> um, I was just saying that um, there are current programs, obviously, in Chicago, Baltimore, Dallas, and there are others developing in Philadelphia, Minneapolis, Denver, and you'll hear from King County uh, shortly. So uh, next slide, please. So now you've decided you're going to do mobility. So whoops, this is going a little faster than I thought. Um, so we want to make sure we have adequate rents and search time from the housing authority. We want to define opportunity areas. We want to educate participants. We want to outreach to landlords and opportunity areas. This animation is very cool when it works. <laughs> um, we also want to provide search assistance to our families and one-on-one -on -one counseling and then supportive services post-move are very important. Uh, next slide, please. So how do we define opportunity areas? Um, Gatro used race alone. Uh, MTO used poverty alone. CHA, the agency I work with, uses poverty and the level of subsidized housing in a location. And the map on this slide is the city of Chicago. The green areas are the opportunity areas. And they are done by census tract. Um, in Port Arthur, where we worked uh, recently, we helped them develop uh, a definition for opportunity that used the average race and poverty. 
Um, but I think the movement really is toward a more sophisticated method. Um, and for our regional demonstration, we used um, other indicators like school performance, transportation, labor market access and participation, housing stability, um, and I think there was one more that is currently escaping me. But um, it was a HUD, HUD index, essentially, of these factors that we used um, to, to develop the regional opportunity definition. So there are a whole variety of ways of doing this. And you might want to test some different strategies if you're thinking about doing this for your region. The only word of caution I would say on the HUD index is we had to use the race and poverty filter to be sure we wouldn't promote segregation in our counseling program. And we did have to make some adjustments as a result of that. Um, next slide. Landlord outreach is critical. You have to have units in opportunity areas. So we work on educating landlords, providing good customer service to them. We speak to groups of landlords and realtors. We really try to build relationships. And um, the CHA has used uh, an advisory committee and a, um, a program that recognizes good landlords and provides um, significant appreciation in terms of program efficiencies for them. Um, so that's an important piece of any mo mobility program. Um, next. Um, tenant education. We do quite a bit uh, on this topic and our, our participants really like these workshops. We offer an orientation to opportunity for sure. We also offer landlord tenant rights and responsibilities, uh, financial management, uh, a, a, a workshop on schools matter choosing a good school for your child, um, home maintenance, and building community, which um, gets into um, conflict resolution, voting, sort of being active in your community. Um, and then, of course, part of tenant education is counseling, that one-on-one -on -one work that the counselor does with the family who's looking for a unit addressing their fears and concerns about moving into a new community, uh, making any referrals for social service needs, and providing some problem-solving assistance. Um, and then, of course, unit search assistance. That's probably the most important piece that we do, providing listings, going with clients um, to see units. Um, we provide community tours. Um, that kind of thing. Um, and then once a family does find a unit, sort of holding the deal together um, is actually a task, uh, making sure the inspection gets done, any repairs are done, the HAP is signed, the, just the whole process and trying to keep everything moving along. Um, uh, and then the follow-up, post-move. And I think this often gets shorted because we're so focused on getting the moves themselves. Um, but making sure that families stay in opportunity areas, I think, has become a much more important aspect, especially um, with the recent research on MTO. Um, just the need for families to stay. So we do that. Um, we help them transition into the new community. We assist with any landlord issues. And now we're able to work with them after one year if they need to move. Um, previously, we could not serve people who already lived in opportunity areas. So that's a change and an important one, I think. Um, next slide. Um, and these are some other things that we do here in Illinois. Oops, here goes my my uh, animation again. Um, there we go. OK. Um, you can do a security deposit loan program or a grant program, provide an incentive uh, for families, um, source of income protection that we have in the city and Cook County. 
um, a tax abatement program we have with the state of Illinois, regional project-based programs to provide um, new development and rehab, uh, regional administration of voucher portability, which we've been working on, and uh, as Alex talked about, targeting families with young children in high poverty areas. So those are the basic elements um, of a mobility program, and I hope everybody starts to think about doing one in their particular area. Um, and now I am going to introduce Stephen Norman, the Executive Director of the King County Housing Authority. Thank you, everyone. Well, good morning or afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, I'm delighted to be here today as a Housing Authority practitioner on the ground. There are a lot of Housing Authorities around the country who get this issue, are committed to it, and are in the position of trying to figure out how you actually make this work. In King County, we have a long-standing commitment to educational outcomes for the over 14,000 kids who we house in our subsidized programs. We're currently sharing data with school districts and developing longitudinal tracking to see whether we're successful in moving the needle on the educational front. The strategies we do involve both place-based initiatives in the higher poverty neighborhoods and providing access to high-performing schools in low poverty neighborhoods. We've developed over the years a range of approaches to providing access to high opportunity neighborhoods. And what I'd like to do today is I'd like to briefly review some of the different approaches that we're using. And I think one of the things that's a takeaway from this is that every situation on the ground is different. And strategies that work in Chicago or work in Baltimore or work in King County will of necessity take a diff different tax and react differently to different market conditions, different populations, different demographics. I'd like to discuss the design of a recent um, mobility initiative that we've layered on to our other efforts. And I'd like to conclude with some lessons learned and issues that we are currently grappling with. First, a little bit of background, a uh, quick overview of the region. We are a large metropolitan area with uh, strong population growth. There are about 2 million people living in the uh, Seattle King County SMSA. About two-thirds of those are outside of Seattle. We have 11% uh, poverty rate in the county, and three-quarters of the poverty is in the suburbs, which is an important trend we're seeing nationally. Increasingly, when we talk about poverty, we are talking about uh, poverty in a suburban landscape rather than the traditional inner-city neighborhoods that um, we were dealing with uh, 20 or 30 years ago. We have a poor regional mass transit uh, system, uh, and we, while we have high-poverty neighborhoods, I would say that they are not severely distressed in the classic sense in terms of very high levels of crime, slums, and blight. The Housing Authority serves this metropolitan area outside of the city of Seattle. Uh, we serve 39 suburban uh, jurisdictions as well as the unincorporated parts of the county. We administer about 14,000 federally assisted households. About 11,000 of those are through the Section 8 program. About 3,000 of those are through fixed units. And in addition, we have about 5,000 units of non-federally subsidized workforce housing, which, as you'll see in a minute, also plays a bit of a role uh, in, in our uh, initiatives to date. All told, we've got about 14,500 uh, children who live in the subsidized housing. 70% of our kids are non-white. 27% of the households are immigrant refugee. 90% of the households are below 30% of the area median income. About a quarter of the households that come in every year are coming directly out of homelessness uh, through the shelters and other referral systems we have in partnership with our local committee to end homelessness. And the King County Housing Authority is what's called the Moving to Work Housing Authority, which gives it a significant amount of flexibility in terms of doing away with some of the uh, more uh, problematic HUD rules that stand between you and actually getting mission critical uh, things accomplished. We cover about uh, 19 different uh, school districts. Poverty is concentrated in the south end of King County. And on the east side, uh, in the Bellevue, Redmond, Kirkland, Mercer Island area, uh, you have what has really emerged as a Seattle um, tech belt um, with much higher incomes and the benefits that you would expect from that. There are large disparities in income uh, and, and between uh, these two areas and in poverty. 
the school district uh, free and reduced meal eligibility rates, for example, for the Tuck Willis School District down here is about 70%. And for Mercer Island, just over here, it's about 3%. Three of the districts in the region are uh, Bellevue, Lake Washington, and Mercer Island, again, all over here, um, are districts that are regularly uh, recognized on national lists as being some of the best school districts and having some of the best schools uh, in the country. So KCHA um, used the Kerwin Institute opportunity mapping criteria to identify high and very high opportunity areas. I think you've seen a, a rundown of many of the different criteria in the prior um, presentation. It includes education, economic health and jobs, housing and neighborhood conditions, transportation, health and environmental uh, factors. Predictably, the opportunity areas, which are indicated on the map in green, um, are on the east and north of Lake Washington in the uh, what is now the high-tech belt. Let's focus in on those neighborhoods. Um, and I'm going to disregard, for purposes of this conversation, uh, the incorporated city of Seattle that is not in our catchment area. So we're really looking at the opportunity areas, again, north and east of Lake Washington here. Uh, KCHA. Um, had, been, had already been successful, although not without some um, NIMBY resistance, in citing 10 projects with about 320 units, public housing projects, in these neighborhoods back in the 1980s. And this was really prior to the emergence of the Microsoft and the tech boom, um, but really was our first uh, inroads into this area. Uh, these complexes tend to be in about the 30 unit size uh, in smaller buildings and that are contextual to the neighborhood. Then uh, starting in the 1990s, we ba began acquiring additional properties in these communities. And they really broke down into three different categories. One was larger uh, workforce housing sites, which were 100 plus units. Second was uh, privately owned expiring use Section 8 uh, complexes, where there was a very high likelihood, because these were all going um, upper market. Uh, in the region that those would have been lost as uh, resources um, in opportunity areas. And then smaller uh, 10 to 30 unit properties where we could turn on um, public housing subsidies that had been banked by dint of some of our uh, HOPE 6 and other redevelopment activities. All told, since about 1995, we've purchased about 2,000 units of workforce um, housing um, in the opportunity areas that are east of the lake. One example of that latter category where we turn on public housing is a 30-unit multifamily on Mercer Island um, where we are turning on the public housing as uh, units turn over. Uh, this is in the middle of a school district with a 3% um, free and reduced meal eligibility rate. We use a wide mix of financing strategies to do this involving bonds that the Housing Authority issues, uh, tax credits, soft dollars. Um, and as increasingly we get to a critical mass level in terms of our holdings, uh, enterprise level refinancings and, and pooled uh, uh, issuances of debt. So then we move to the notion of project-based um, Section 8. Um, this became a very potent tool in conjunction with the, uh, the workforce housing. What we started to do is to put project-based Section 8 in small numbers under 25% of the units in the larger 100-unit-plus developments that we had purchased uh, around the opportunity areas. Uh, we've also found that um, voucher holders who are desirous of moving into these areas also gravitate to this housing because there's an opportunity um, to have a friendly landlord who gets the Section 8 program, is comfortable with it, is comfortable with the paperwork, and welcomes them in. We also started to marry project-based replacement vouchers um, from our high poverty neighborhood HOPE 6 projects. This is where we were deconcentrating the number of assisted units in higher poverty areas in the region. We would essentially uh, transmute those public housing subsidies into project-based Section 8, and we would use it in conjunction with a pipeline of nonprofit developed housing that's also developing in the region. So the, there's a regional consortium on the east side that is um, funding in conjunction with county and state resources and tax credits, uh, development of additional affordable housing. Typically, of course, under the tax credit program, you're really not getting affordability uh, below the 50 to 60 percent of AMI level. 
by project-basing the Section 8, which is done in conjunction with a very progressive State Housing Finance Commission scoring system that really gave points for deep subsidy, extremely low-income units in terms of the very competitive 9% credits, incented folks to come to us and say, we want to put project-based vouchers in for a portion of the units in these projects as well. So between those, we were able to put about 660 uh, project-based Section 8 into these high opportunity and very high opportunity areas as well. Then on the tenant-based voucher side, um, we look to essentially uh, encourage in a multiple ways folks moving into these areas. Uh, key initiatives that we were able to do under moving to work is we went to a two-tiered payment standard. We decoupled those payment standards from the uh, fair market rent. And so by two-tiered, I mean that uh, one level was essentially reflected the high market rents that you see um, in the east side and the second the uh, lower rent you see in South County, rather than having a single standard that arguably led the market in South King County and was inadequate to really get into uh, the higher income areas. Um, our opportunity zone payment standard is currently at about 130% of the FMR. What that means is, for example, on a two-bedroom subsidy in the opportunity zones, we are paying about $300 more in subsidy than we are in, in South County. And we have, as a result, about 2,600 um, tenant-based voucher holders in these opportunity areas. I think the ability to go to multi-tiered standards is important, particularly given the, uh, the lack of resources, financial resources we're facing, because I think there are some offsetting savings by not leading the market in South County that helps sustain our ability to go uh, significantly higher in terms of subsidy levels in the opportunity areas. We're currently looking to shift to four or more tiers to more fine-tune the actual payment standards to individual submarkets to go to this on a zip code-based system, uh, which is necessitating an actual shift to a new software platform for the Section 8 program. Based on the literature from the first generation of mobility studies, particularly around high-quality school access, um, we further refined the mapping beyond the Kerwin Institute opportunity areas to catchment areas for schools that have 20% uh, or below free and reduced meal eligibility. And this was driven, I think, in part by the good work that was done by Heather Schwartz on the uh, Montgomery study uh, and a variety of other indices uh, in terms of school quality. So essentially what you can see here is a map of the opportunity area where the, the parts of the opportunity area that actually do not make the grade under a refined uh, mapping that really looks on a micro level at the catchment areas for individual uh, elementary schools, uh, it pulls them out in terms of that threshold of where we would want to try to put folks. So um, what we have done now is we have redrawn our map and we have instituted a new mobility project that is going to try to focus directly on those high education opportunity areas within the Kerwin zones. So a quick recap, um, we're seeing that about 30% of our place-based units regionally are in high or very high opportunity areas. About 21 of our tenant-based units uh, in the aggregate, 24% of our subsidized units for families with children are in either high or very high opportunity areas. We didn't put in a, uh, a third column, but if we were to pull out the um, areas where we were actually in the catchment areas of schools that made the cut, uh, we would actually be having those numbers. We'd be looking at about a 12% are in those actual school catchment areas, and that would be split pretty evenly between the tenant-based and the place-based units. So we went to a new mobility design. Uh, much of it, I think you've already heard the key elements of. We brought in two nonprofit uh, partners uh, that um, one was to essentially work with families in the high poverty neighborhoods they were living in. Um, the concern is that you needed a partner who was already a known entity. Um, two folks who lived in those communities um, was a trusted advocate um, who could essentially uh, do the educational um, work around the equating uh, geographic choice with education choice, um, working with folks to ascertain their readiness to move. And they partnered with a nonprofit that is uh, based on the east side uh, to look at 
finding housing, housing assistance, uh, doing the post-placement uh, support, including um, networking them into the uh, after-school programs and helping them navigate the school system. We used uh, Quadell to advise us. This was a, a very deliberate process to, to walk through this. Uh, we decided to target existing voucher holders because we found that most folks just coming into the program were pretty much in crisis, were primarily interested in finding a place to live, uh, and were not really um, focused on sort of that second move to a quality area. We find also with uh, households already on the program that have already self-identified as movers, most folks on the program who are moving tend to be making reactive rather than strategic moves, and they tend also to be in crisis as well. So we were re reaching out really to stable voucher holders to talk to them about the possibility of moving, what the pros and cons were. We targeted households with small children uh, based on the interest in getting folks to situate their kids in a high quality school uh, early on and to keep them in there that the, the uh, length of exposure to that school system was a key indicator of where the success would actually go uh, downstream. Um, we again targeted the, um, the opportunity areas that we had identified sort of on a micro level. We had encouraged summer moves because with, to the degree these children, these families have children in school, we didn't want them to disrupt uh, schools and shift classrooms in mid-year. This may in retrospect have been a somewhat overly ambitious uh, desire in that it essentially limits the period in which they can secure housing to a very narrow window, and it's a narrow window that is arguably the most competitive because of summers where everybody else is trying to move. And then we put in uh, very robust uh, post-move supports, uh, looking at the factors I've just enumerated uh, and trying to make sure that folks really are able to connect in uh, to the school system in the neighborhood. So what are the challenges? Well, the neighborhoods with the best schools are mostly single-family neighborhoods, and there's primarily home ownership there. There's a limited number of rental um, opportunities. Uh, we found that to the degree that there are rental opportunities, they are single-family homes, and if you have a mother with one child, for example, uh, that becomes a problem because there are a few single-family homes that only have two bedrooms and arguably the family would be overhoused and also would be picking up a significant amount of the rent uh, on their own dime rather than through the voucher payment. We found that rents are uh, expensive and that actually we are now rerunning our payment standards and we're finding that the differential between our lower market payment standard and our upper tier payment standard uh, in these neighborhoods is actually more like $500 per month rather than uh, the 300 that when we had had it several years ago. Uh, this is, in fact, part of the natural result is as neighborhoods grow more affluent, those neighborhoods with the best schools become more desirable, and you're seeing significant upticks in rental costs to the degree that they are even available there. We also hear loud and clear from folks who are looking at this program that they are concerned about the neighborhood costs. Uh, there is no question that in these higher-income neighborhoods, child care costs more, transportation costs more, food costs more. Uh, the cost of having a single-family home where there are a number of things that are not covered in the rent, such as maintaining the lawns, uh, is something that folks have to deal with as opposed to being in, a, in an apartment. Um, so there is concern on the part of very limited-income households about what are they taking on in terms of disposable uh, income that they may have. We're also seeing distance and cultural isolation. One of the issues in suburban po poverty geographies is that it's not necessarily the next um, community over. It may be 20, 25 miles from where you're currently living to the Opportunity neighborhood. Um, these become large distances, particularly with a lack of adequate uh, transportation. We find that there are distances from cultural institutions. For example, concerns we would get from uh, our large Somali immigrant refugee population is moving to many of these areas. There was no halal butcher. That was anywhere near where they were. The imams are a 30-minute drive away. Um, there's also a lack of family support, which is critical in low-income households always, but particularly in the immigrant refugee communities we're dealing with where they have very close-knit supportive families. This kind of voluntary estrangement, if you will, from the rest of the family uh, was not something that struck them as being uh, in their best interest. And finally, on the older kids in the family, if there were older kids, 
Um, there is it's a different set of academic standards. If you pull a kid out of 11th grade um, in one of our higher poverty school districts and you put him on Mercer Island, um, his ability to perform at grade level as his peers are currently at in that system without the benefit of what they have gotten for the last 12 years is extremely problematic. And there is a uh, certain significant peer group isolation that has to be dealt with as well. So just some quick reflections here. One is that, um, and again, I think that the strategies will vary uh, from area to area. But what we found is that fixed unit strategies have a role to play in promoting geographic choice. Uh, once you get them in, there are greater cost controls in the sense that on the project-based Section 8 and on the public housing units we have uh, in high opportunity neighborhoods, we are no longer um, completely at the mercy of where the market goes. And as the market goes up, the issue that's now been raised in Chicago about super vouchers becomes a real issue. If we are renting four and five bedroom single family homes in Bellevue, um, those are numbers that are going to start to raise people's eyebrows. So the ability to have um, some level of fixed units where we can control costs, uh, and also that there's greater housing security in that it's hard to set down roots when you're in a rental that the landlord is interested in raising the rent in every time the market goes up because there will inevitably be a point when you're going to outstrip where we are on the payment standard. So our ability to keep people on site, which we see to be a critical issue in the success of these programs long term, our ability to enable people to set down roots in the community is enhanced by having fixed unit strategies. We think there's a need to incentivize fixed unit strategies. Uh, one example is that we have emerging mass transit corridors that are quickly going to become high-end opportunity neighborhoods. I can tell you that the suburban jurisdictions that are on these cor corridors are not necessarily um, that enamored with uh, affordable, particularly deep targeted affordable housing and the kind of um, zoning and tax benefits that have been talked about aren't going to get you there. Uh, I think what they are interested in, however, is federal transportation dollars. And you could do more for housing by convincing the Department of Transportation to put um, some competitive points in the Tiger Grant and the UMTA Grant um, offerings for communities that are willing to commit to deep subsidized units along the transportation corridors that they're getting the federal government to invest in, that will go a long way towards getting uh, suburban cities to the table uh, to get those points so that they can compete for the big bucks that come down through the transportation pipelines. Big issue, the elephant in the room is cost. Uh, moving opportunity areas uh, does result in a big bump in payment standards. This is going against a zero-sum game that is actually, I'm not even sure it's a zero-sum game. I think it's sort of a, uh, it, we're at minus zero at this point. Uh, there have been about 80,000 housing choice vouchers uh, lost, uh, my understanding through the uh, estimates of the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, through sequestration to date. And the stark choice that a provider like myself gets into is do I house five folks five households in a um, high opportunity area, or do I house seven households in an area which is not extreme poverty but doesn't have the kind of opportunities that we would like ultimately to move everybody to? The other piece is that this is administratively um, hard on housing authorities. Uh, they are willing to do it. They need the staff and the resources to do it. The current pro rate in terms of uh, funding for administrative costs on the Section 8 program is down to 79% of what HUD says it costs to actually run the program. And that is for the straight administration of the program. We inspect uh, some 11,000 units a year. We do a massive amount of paperwork. We deal with tenant crises and landlord crises every day of the week. Um, the notion that that's not even getting into layering on the kind of bells and whistles that you need to really do uh, mobility right. Uh, you cannot do that on a 79% prorate. There has to be some reality uh, in the conversation about what housing authorities can and can't do with the level of resources that they have. Finally, the last point I would make is that I fully agree that there are significant number of rules within the HUD program that need to be changed. However, 
my uh, recommendation would be that we be careful not to substitute a new set of HUD rigidities for an old set of HUD rigidities. I think that flexibility so that housing authorities uh, who are properly incented can use the resources on the ground to the maximum effect uh, is the way to go. Uh, the moving to work uh, program needs to be expanded. This gives housing authorities, high performing housing authorities, an ability to be much more flexible in fashioning approaches that are going to work in their particular region. Thank you, and I'm very happy to turn this over to Barbara. Thank you. Um, I'm Barbara Samuels with the uh, Fair Housing Project of the ACLU of Maryland. Um, if we can get to advance the slides, please. OK, just a moment. And can you speak a little bit louder, please, Barbara? Certainly. See if I can get your slide up. There we go. OK, if, and move to the first slide, please. OK, thank you. So uh, you've heard a lot about the nuts and bolts of housing mobility. Um, and I've been asked to um, uh, more specifically address an aspect of the Baltimore Housing Mobility Program uh, that takes us back in some ways to Alex's uh, very eloquent plea for the, for the moral uh, imperative of housing mobility. Um, and that is the ways in which uh, residential segregation puts kids in harm's way. And our effort in the uh, housing uh, mobility program in Baltimore is now uh, taking that very much uh, uh, to mind and targeting our efforts more deliberately to help get children out of harm's way. Uh, so Alex recounted some of what I think are uh, now undisputed harms to children who are exposed to community violence and other adverse conditions in very poor neighborhoods. Um, and these are, these include, um, but go beyond things like uh, impaired cognitive de development and um, that is equivalent to missing a year or more of schooling. Um, importantly, these effects are cumulative and they are inherited across generations. And so the more uh, time is of the essence here, the longer children are exposed to these conditions and the more uh, repeatedly they are exposed to these conditions, the, the greater the harm. Um, and uh, researchers think that these harms account for much of the black-white achievement gap that in so many aspects of our society uh, we're, we're trying to deal with. Uh, for us here at the ACLU of Maryland, fair housing, of course, is a racial justice issue. But in, in addition to that, through our work on education and trying to improve Baltimore City Schools and our work with uh, police abuse and criminal justice and uh, mass incarceration, we, we also see the, the you know, results of very widespread trauma in our inner city communities along with a great deal of human resilience, but a, but a lot of trauma um, that really takes a toll on people in those communities. So one effort uh, that has been underway as a result of some of our fair housing litigation is the Baltimore Housing Mobility Program. And um, the program's now a little bit over 10 years old, and during that time, um, Nearly 2,600 families have moved to higher opportunity areas. The program started as uh, repl using replacement vouchers for um, public housing that was being demolished in a high-rise setting in inner city Baltimore. And so it's always had a focus on serving families uh, with children. And 85% uh, of the people who have moved to date are families with, with one or more children. Next slide, please. Um, so the program, just uh, briefly by way of background, uh, is in an expansion mode. It is uh, receiving additional funding through 2018 as a result of a final settlement in the Thompson versus HUD litigation. Um, and that's providing 400 additional vouchers each year through 2018 so that by, by that time, the end of 2018, the program will be 
about 4,400 vouchers, which will make it the third largest housing authority in, in our region. In fact, uh, it already is the third largest voucher program in the region. The program is now operated uh, by a, a nonprofit organization called the Baltimore Regional Housing Partnership. And effective July 1st of this year, the, the board of the um, housing partnership decided to give uh, priority to families with young children under age eight in our case, uh, and those living in the highest poverty neighborhoods, those that are more than 30% uh, uh, poverty rate. And to, to really target uh, this very limited um, assistance more tightly to, to those families. And, and this came out not about not only from the research uh, results that, that we've heard about, but importantly from the families that we've served over the last 10 years, uh, where we have heard, as many mobility programs have, that, that the priority for families in signing up for mobility programs and making mobility moves is to get their families, uh, their children, to a safer and a better environment. As, uh, and then only after they're in a uh, safer and better environment can they actually begin to think about looking for better schools and, and other amenities like that. But safety for any parent is really job one. Um, and, and also then the experience and what we hear from our families about the quality of life improvements that they experience after they move where, again, the most salient is, is peace of mind, a greater feeling of safety, less anxiety, less stress, uh, more motivation, uh, less depression, and a, better, a feeling that they are in a better environment for raising um, their children. So the program um, uh, has a system of preferences, like those used in many voucher programs, one of those preferences uh, targets families with an urgent need for relocation, and, and this can include um, urgent needs like a medical condition of a family member, such as a child with asthma. And then what we are also calling the early childhood preference, uh, where uh, ranking preference points are awarded for families with children, plus additional points for families with young children, and then additional points if that family lives in a neighborhood with a poverty rate of 30% or higher. Next slide. Uh, again, local conditions are important. And unlike the situation in King County, uh, we are talking about clients here coming from some of the most distressed neighborhoods uh, in the nation. Um, these are not. Um, areas that are experiencing gentrification or an in-migration of um, immigrants or anything of the sort. They are largely already uh, abandoned neighborhoods. Um, and they are surrounded by low poverty suburbs. The, the uh, poverty rate in the Baltimore suburbs is the fourth lowest in the country. And the state of Maryland is the most affluent state in the country. So we have this real dichotomy of, of severely uh, uh, disinvested and abandoned neighborhoods in the midst of affluence. Uh, next slide, please. And one way to look at the harm that, that is experienced by families and children growing up in, in these circumstances is to look at some of the indicators that, that public health experts look at. And, Probably the bottom line is life expectancy. In the neighborhoods where our families are starting out, um, the life expectancy is 20 years shorter than the life expectancy in more affluent parts of the city, not to mention uh, parts of the suburbs. Next slide, please. So the, the policy rationale for this early childhood preference um, is the evidence of the biology of child development that, that Alex uh, talked about as we started out the, um, the webinar highlighting the importance of 
safe and supportive environments in the earliest years of a, a months of a child's life. Um, the cumulative impact of toxic stress from adverse experiences. The, um, the fact that the chronic exposure to violence, um, that is the repeated exposure, the cumulative effect of it, is disruptive to children's emotional and social development um, and suppresses eventually their academic achievement once they reach school age. And importantly, um, the research suggests that, that one of the best uh, protective mechanisms and buffers for children is their parents and a, and a supportive, um, stable, um, responsive relationship with parents. But the research also shows that parents who are themselves subject to trauma um, by exposure to adverse circumstances and, and uh, community violence, that their ability to, to buffer their children is, is itself compromised. Um, and I think one of the, the more uh, chilling um, pieces of research evidence to come out um, recently comes to us by way of Patrick Sharkey and the evidence that he presents that these impacts of, of uh, childhood exposure to distressed and violent neighborhoods are actually inherited across generations. Um, and he found that as a sociologist the, the um, biomedical researchers are actually finding that the chronic exposure to uh, trauma and uh, stress hormones actually causes epigenetic changes in genes and, and more literally leads to the um, inheritance of these uh, harms across generations. So uh, can you go back one, one moment, please? Pat, yes, thank you. So looking at all of this, it, it seems uh, to us that, that while many um, people are doing quite heroic things in trying to uh, revitalize neighborhoods, trying to improve um, schools in these neighborhoods and to lower the achievement gaps, many people are, are uh, you know, I think the standard of care now in in mental health care is trauma-informed care, and people are trying to provide services <coughs> to families affected by trauma. Um, the, the fact is that, that prevention is always more effective and less costly than later remediation <coughs> and treatment. And so the question we, we ask ourselves is, you know, do we have a tool here in housing mobility that can actually um, uh, be used to prevent these cumulative harms, or at least to, to stop them from, uh, in their tracks? Now, the voucher program, next slide, as you've heard, is, uh, is the backbone of um, certainly the, the um, uh, mobility programs based on tenant-based vouchers, but even for the, the project-based voucher programs and is, is the most flexible vehicle for helping families to get their children out of harm's way. But actually, nationally, the percentage of housing vouchers that are going to families with children has actually been declining over recent years. This is the data just for our jurisdiction um, here the, the, in Baltimore City, where there's been a really dramatic drop-off in um, voucher participation by families with children from 65% of the vouchers in 2000 to just 44% last year. Next slide. And so we have to do better to um, align the next slide, please. Next slide. Thank you. To align the voucher program as a whole. Um, with the research on early childhood and the um, research coming out of economics showing that early childhood interventions are more, both more effective and more cost effective. Right now the voucher program is not 
<clears throat> particularly a, a child-centered program. And um, you know, we're conscious of the fact that not everybody has an existing mobility program. Not everybody is a moving to work housing authority. Baltimore as is as is Chicago and King County and many of the largest um, housing authorities. But this is uh, there are lessons that can be applied to the regular voucher program, whether or not one has a mobility program and whether or not one has uh, moving to work flexibility. So in the first instance, housing authorities can adopt uh, preferences for families with children for their general housing choice voucher programs. This, this can help at least um, target the scarce voucher assistance to children and their families who are, after all, the, uh, the future of our communities, um, and to try to reverse some of the erosion in the share of vouchers that have been going to those families um, over the past decade or, or 15 years or so. Um, now, it, in order to target more specifically uh, families with young children, we, there may need to be a change in um, HUD's Housing Choice Voucher Handbook. Uh, this is one of the uh, sort of rules that guide the voucher program. It's not regulatory. It's not statutory. But there is language in that handbook that uh, HUD officials interpret to say that uh, it's not permissible to have a, a um, preference for early childhood. That's not based on any actual prohibition in the uh, handbook itself. And, and to the contrary, the, um, the regulations and the handbook are very geared towards protecting families with children from familial status discrimination. So I think that's not a correct interpretation of the handbook, but nonetheless, it's a it's a barrier that, that uh, you may encounter and that, that we may need to, to deal with. Um, in addition to uh, adopting a preference for families with children and um, more specifically for families with young children and early childhood preference, um, moving to work housing authorities can actually go a step beyond that and set aside a certain pot of their vouchers to target to families with children or families with young children. So for instance, now our housing authority has, um, has an array of set-asides for various public policy objectives. All very important objectives, such as reentry of offenders. Um, there's a pot of 200 vouchers set aside for that population. Um, but there, the, the, uh, out of this array of set-asides, only one is actually geared towards children, and it's fully subscribed. And so um, what, what we think would be both an effective uh, early intervention and, and a way to uh, provide families with children and young children a more fair share of the, the vouchers in our jurisdiction is to have a set aside of um, vouchers for families with young children that could be they could come from the waiting list or they could come as referrals from say an, an asthma clinic or a um, we have a very robust home visiting program to reduce infant mortality here to to, to align those efforts with the um, resources that the housing voucher program has um, and and it, Again, this is, um, this is not really new territory. There are set-asides for a whole array of special populations. Uh, surely we think the, the, that young children um, are at least as important a policy priority as, as those other uh, populations that are served through a set-aside. Um, coincidentally, perhaps this is a very salient issue for, for us here in Baltimore today because our waiting list for vouchers is opening for the first time in 13 years. And uh, it's opening today, and it will only be open for seven days. And uh, the Housing Authority is expecting 50 to 100,000 families to apply. 
So I, I'll just close with a saying from Baltimore's own Frederick Douglass, which is that it's better to build strong children than to repair broken men. And then I will turn it over to Phil Tegler. Uh, thank you, Barbara. Uh, I saw a number of uh, people I see on the list here at the uh, fourth national conference on housing mobility two years ago. Um, and I'm really pleased to be joining NAFA for this uh, great webinar, which I think shows how much progress we've made in just the past two years in this field. Um, I'm going to quickly cover a few statistics on vouchers uh, and schools, uh, and then cover some of the basics of voucher access uh, for, for advocates on the phone, uh, primarily. Um, and uh, I promise to be quick because we want to leave some time for, for Q&A. Um, first of all, I want to direct your attention to two uh, uh, recent reports. Uh, one was put out by PRAC on uh, uh, housing and school uh, access to high-performing schools, um, and uh, which I'll talk about briefly. And the other just came out this week from the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, which summarizes a lot of both the research we've been discussing and also the recommendations um, that uh, Alex and others on the phone have talked about uh, in terms of improving voucher access. These are available on the PRAC website, prrac.org, and the Center on Budget website, cbpp.org. Um, going back to the, the, some of the school points that have been made, uh, you know, we know from decades of research on uh, school integration that low-income children do better academically and in terms of other educational outcomes when they attend lower poverty schools. The evidence is pretty unequivocal. Uh, and this was powerfully confirmed in the recent study that Alex mentioned in Montgomery County, where, they, where Heather Schwartz was able to match public housing records with county school district data for individual public housing children and found that children living near and attending lower poverty schools in the county significantly outperformed similar children attending moderate and high poverty schools. It really does matter. And these kids who were in units uh, zoned to low poverty schools uh, had increased math and reading scores uh, that substantially outpaced their, their peers in the high poverty schools. Even in high poverty schools in Montgomery County, where the county was uh, placing additional uh, resources, uh, uh, additional financial and educational resources. Um, but uh, our report, uh, which was done by researchers from the Furman uh, Institute, found that the voucher program is not delivering families to good schools for the most part. Um, nationally, uh, we found that among housing choice voucher families with children, uh, the average school proficiency rating was at the 26th percentile of school performance in the region where the family is located. The average school uh, for those voucher families was a 74 percent free and reduced lunch uh, uh, population, in, in other words, a high poverty school. Um, we also found very alarmingly that a full 25 percent of voucher holders nationally were uh, zoned near to an elementary school ranked in the bottom 10 uh, percent uh, in the state. Um, these are alarming results, and if you go to the uh, uh, report, which is on our website and also on the housingmobility.org website, which I'll mention later, you can actually click on your metro area and your state and see how bad things are there for your voucher program, because these national data um, are not, they're much more extreme in the most segregated metros, and you'll find uh, your own uh, patterns. Uh, depending on the region you're in. Um, now, I'm going to review at this point some of the policy changes that are necessary to give families living in higher poverty neighborhoods access to lower poverty, higher opportunity communities, particularly uh, communities with higher performing schools. For fair housing advocates of local public housing agencies, these are the kind of barriers that need to be removed and overcome at the local level. For HUD, they represent policies that need to be implemented more widely. I'm first going to cover barriers to admission 
to housing programs in low poverty, often suburban communities. These are barriers that are unnecessary, barriers that disadvantage our clients, and barriers that may violate the Fair Housing Act. And I'll go over these fairly quickly, and as you'll see, for each barrier, um, there's a possible solution uh, listed. First of all, very common uh, procedures uh, for admission to both uh, project-based and, and, and tenant-based uh, suburban programs uh, include in-person application procedures, um, online applications, uh, detailed application forms, uh, limited locations for submitting applications, and narrow time windows uh, for, uh, for applications. All of these uh, procedures um, have the great potential to discriminate uh, on the basis of race and disability. And there's very simple solutions to each of these to make them less discriminatory. A mail-in option for applications, uh, multiple ways of applying, uh, simple pre-application forms to get you into a lottery as opposed to filling out uh, a detailed application at the, at, the, at the first instance, multiple locations for submitting the applications if you're not doing it by mail, and opening up uh, the uh, lottery for an extended period of time so people uh, the best, uh, the people in the know don't get there uh, first. Um, a few other very common uh, barriers to admission uh, in these higher opportunity areas um, are procedures to have town by town or PHA by PHA applications as opposed to applications on a regional level. Um, first come, first serve wait lists have been called out by many of us for years. Um, it's about the most discriminatory thing a PHA can do uh, to uh, to, to, to privilege those people who apply first, um, uh, easily remedied by uh, uh, the use of uh, lotteries. Um, residency preferences, obviously, uh, <laughs> uh, illegal in most cases, but uh, uh, often not even challenged by advocates where there is a discriminatory impact. And credit checks and criminal background checks, um, many of you know about these issues criminal background checks much too blunt if they don't take into account, uh, you know, uh, how recent the offense is, the degree of recidivism, and the seriousness of the offense. And credit checks, of course, um, are not good uh, predictors of, of tenant uh, uh, behavior and, and, and quality. And there's, there's less discriminatory alternatives for each of these uh, barriers to uh, client access. Uh, next, we're going to look at a series of uh, barriers or potentially discriminatory practices where a family already is holding a housing choice voucher. That would be in a typical, like a, a city housing authority where the, the tenant's seeking to exercise some mobility rights to move to a, a better school district or a lower crime area. Um, most of the barriers that are listed here are built into the structure of the housing choice voucher program, as Alex uh, described and need to be fixed by HUD. But some of these can also be addressed by changes at the local level and by fair housing advocacy uh, by local advocates in cooperation with the local PHA. Um, now these are all barriers that, a high, that, that high quality mobility programs are already addressing. Um, uh, King County has done away with all of these, I'm sure. Uh, but these are still important advocacy goals in places that don't yet have a housing mobility program. Um, on this, uh, the list on the screen, we first of all have the rent issues. Um, HUD's continued use of uh, regional fair market rents to calculate what the, uh, the rent cap will be for, for units. Um, when you're looking at the 40th percentile of all the rents in a region, that obviously in most segregated metros is going to pull down rents uh, to be more favorable to rents at the center of the region and provide less access to higher rents in higher opportunity areas. Um, it's a crazy system. It's, it's completely made up by HUD. It needs to be fixed. Um, the uh, uh, related problem is one of payment standards set by the public housing agencies between, usually between 90 and 110 percent of the fair market rent. Um, uh, many PHAs are under the misapprehension that uh, it makes sense to uh, serve, uh, quote unquote, more families with lower payment standards in higher poverty neighborhoods. Um, this is something local advocacy can get out, 
get out to an extent to increase payment standards, but ultimately it's going to be up to HUD to change the FMR structure to go to small area FMRs by zip code to provide families with an opportunity to get into um, a reasonable proportion of the rental units uh, in each zip code based on the varying rents within a metro. Some of the other discriminatory features of the program uh, are the administrative fee structure, which uh, Steve talked about, um, where uh, PHAs are basically paid the same amount per voucher for uh, a move that doesn't take any effort at all versus a move that will take you know, weeks to help a family find a unit in a, in a better neighborhood. Um, this clearly needs to be fixed, as well as the, the assessment procedure HUD uses for PHAs, which doesn't really reward PHAs for doing a better job in terms of housing mobility and location. Um, there's also a lot of barriers in the portability process, um, which is also subject to local advocacy. Um, uh, things like delays in paperwork and inspections, um, switching uh, staff, traveling to new offices, uh, a lot of barriers for the clients uh, and also uh, for the landlord. Um, uh, delays relating to the waitlist administration, and of course, uh, discrimination uh, against voucher holders. And you know, we have uh, uh, about nine states now um, that uh, prohibit discrimination, uh, discrimination against, uh, on the basis of source of income. Um, those are included in an, an appendix to our expanding choice report, which I'll mention in a moment. Um, and uh, there's a number of places that are now trying to get these laws on the books, including Washington State has a new campaign right now, uh, which hopefully will finally succeed this year after several tries. Uh, final list of uh, uh, barriers, uh, many of which are subject to local advocacy. Um, the landlord and apartment listings that uh, many PHAs hand out to tenants in desperately seeking uh, uh, housing uh, uh, are disproportionately located in high poverty segregated neighborhoods. Um, it's pretty astonishing if you look at some of the uh, listings as we have and map them uh, by, uh, by race and poverty uh, in the area. Um, this is a very obvious fair housing violation in my opinion uh, that needs to be addressed by local PHAs, by local advocates. Get a hold of the landlord list that they're handing out, map them, and, and bring that information to the PHA. Uh, that, that's something that needs to be reformed across the board. HUD uh, uh, seems not to be moving on that issue, as far as we can tell. Um, uh, landlord behavior, uh, recruiting tenants in Section 8 submarkets. Um, uh, recent research has just shown the range of behaviors that, that uh, landlords in places where they can't rent their units uh, in the regular market, the, the uh, the efforts they will make to recruit um, and, uh, and market to, to Section 8 families, um, this needs to be monitored uh, in wherever, whatever region you're working in and addressed. Uh, limited search time, obviously, the, uh, the harder uh, uh, a unit is to find, the more time a family will need, and I think this should be routine extensions of search time for families searching in high opportunity areas. Um, uh, Rescreening, lack of information. Um, et cetera, uh, all of these barriers to uh, Section 8 housing mobility are part of the new assessment tool that HUD has put out for the affirmatively furthering a fair housing rule, um, which is currently up for comment. Um, and I think, I think that is a process um, when your jurisdiction and PHA comes up for review under the uh, affirmatively furthering fair housing rule. That's an opportunity to go in and to uh, do a diagnosis of the local Section 8 voucher program and how it's uh, performing. Um, uh, finally, I'll note uh, the website uh, housingmobility.org, um, which includes uh, a number of stories, um, best practices, and uh, research uh, materials on housing mobility. Um, and you will find there um, uh, soon, I hope, this webinar for your colleagues who weren't able to hear it um, if, uh, once we get that from NAFA. And, and also, we have a copy of uh, the report which came out of the last Housing Mobility Conference called Expanding Choice, 
which is kind of a step-by-step -step guide to developing a housing mobility program. And that's the report that has the appendix listing all of the uh, state and local uh, statutes and ordinances uh, banning source of income discrimination. So uh, hopefully that leaves enough time, Cheryl, for questions, and I'll stop it there. Okay. Thank you, and that's, uh, to all our members and those participating on the call, thank you for um, for attending so, um, so for being so attentive. Uh, Kevin is going to start off uh, handling the questions that you've been submitting on the the um, panel there. Uh, he'll address it to particular presenters or general to them. And I just want to remind you, we will have the PowerPoint available, hopefully within 24 hours to everyone, and as well make it available to the housingmobility.org, as well as to all the presenters who uh, were so kind and gracious to be with us. So Kevin, questions? Yeah, thanks so much, Cheryl. So we have a few people uh, with their hands raised right now, so we'll go ahead and uh, call on you one by one. So um, first we have uh, Angela McIver, and we're going to unmute you right now so you can ask your question. Go ahead, Angela. Are you still there, Angela? Okay, we'll go ahead and come back to you. Uh, Susan Watkins also has her hand up with a question. Go ahead, Susan. Uh, Susan, we're not able to hear you. Make sure you're unmuted on your phone. Is there a written question that we could respond to while these two ladies are getting ready to speak? Sure. Let me go ahead and read a question we have from Robert Strupp. Uh, he has a question. Uh, what are the panelists' thoughts about the Tacoma, Washington, uh, McCarver Elementary School Special Housing Program? Uh, it's a program that links rental housing assistance uh, to a commitment that the students remain in the school. Um, to basically, to receive the voucher, families must agree to keep their children enrolled in McCarver for as long as they receive assistance. So if anyone has a, an answer to that question. Uh, well, this is Phil Tegler. Uh, I, I think that approach may be uh, legally problematic, um, and I would, uh, I think it's a, you know, potentially a valuable experiment in that one place. I would urge other public housing agencies not to uh, replicate that kind of approach, as I think it may not be consistent with the Section 8 uh, statute. Um, and obviously, it raises fair housing concerns, Robert. Uh, as you, I think, imp are implying. But I think Steve is much closer uh, to Tacoma than I am, so I'll let him. <laughs> At least geographically. Yes. Uh, uh, well, I, I think it's a very interesting experiment that they are doing. And, and the conundrum that I would put out to the group is that this was a program design that was developed by the housing authority in very close consultation with the school district. And if you Keep in mind that the ultimate goal that we're all looking at is that these children succeed. I have heard the superintendent, and I have heard the principal of that elementary school wax rhapsodic about the impact of using the housing dollars in this way to stabilize um, the classrooms that have a multiplier impact, not just on uh, these particular kids, but on the rest of the kids in classrooms and by extension the whole school. So I think the conundrum we have to sort out is that yes, we are looking at mobility to maximize the number of children who have an opportunity to succeed educationally. Here we have a group of educators on the ground saying that this approach, which I call the housing immobility option, uh, actually is the most beneficial thing that they can do for the largest group of children at risk in this community. So while I don't know where this is going to go, I think it's a legitimate conversation to be having. And I just want this is still again, I'd like to just add to that. I you know, if uh, if HUD ultimately says that it's okay to uh, for an MTW uh, flexible uh, public housing agency to uh, restrict your location with your housing voucher, um, 
I, I think if, if that ultimately is their position, um, I, I think we should revisit Alex Polikoff's proposal um, that we target a, a number of housing choice vouchers uh, in MTW agencies to high-performing schools in low-poverty areas, because if it's permissible to to require a family to uh, to stay in a uh, a school like the Tacoma School, it should also be possible in other places uh, to to limit voucher uh, use uh, for a certain set aside of vouchers to uh, to higher opportunity areas. Okay, thanks so much. Uh, we have a couple other questions, actually. Um, I see Mary Lee Gilmore currently has her hand raised, so I'd like to go ahead and unmute her, and uh, she can go ahead and ask her question. Go ahead. OK, while we're waiting on that, um, I'm going to go ahead and read another question we have, actually, uh, through the, the chat function. Um, let's see here. So um, I didn't notice that this comes from Jim Barry saying, I didn't notice that in any of the photos shown um, in the presentation, uh, none of them included a family with a father. Has any analysis been done on the success rates of two-parent versus single-parent households who participate in mobility programs? Barbara or Chris, do you have any comments on that question? I don't, I, really I can't speak to that. We have no research. Um, I would say the majority of our, our uh, households are female-headed households. Um, so I don't know, Barbara, do you have any thoughts? Uh, no, I mean, we see largely female-headed households in, in our program. Um, so um, we really don't have enough uh, data regarding two-parent households to be able to draw any real conclusion. Uh, this is Cheryl again. I wonder if in all the work that's been done in Gautreau, if there's any um, informal guess that BPI can take as far as how many uh, male-headed households or two-parent households that they have seen um, over the years. Well, Gatrol was, this is Alex speaking, Gatrol was run in large part uh, before the era of mass incarceration. Uh, I don't recall a specific uh, examination of the number of uh, two-parent households that were involved in the Gatrol program, uh, but it wouldn't uh, cast much light on the current conditions, even if there was a study at that time. I think this question profoundly raises a related and very important issue, the mass incarceration uh, program, I'll call it, uh, in, in our country, which disables so many African American young men from entering responsible parenthood, uh, from being marriageable. And uh, that's a separate problem that we've got to deal with. As uh, Stephen Norman and others have indicated, there are uh, an awful lot of challenges just to implement a good mobility program <laughs> are taking on the mass incarceration issue as well. OK, great. So maybe we can move on to the next question. Um, Jessica Schneider asks, uh, how do we go about getting HUD to change FMRs and make them more localized uh, by zip code, for example? Well, I'll, uh, I don't really know the answer uh, to that. Uh, I think uh, persuasion uh, is the preferable route to go, but I'm not too optimistic about it. I suggested in my remarks that uh, uh, litigation uh, might bring about uh, more discussion and ultimately uh, lead to the desirable result. I don't know if that's the case. It's something that maybe ought to be tried or considered. I think, as Phil Tegler said, uh, it is so perfectly obvious that the current um, FMR approach, uh, long-standing FMR approach, 
is counterproductive from a fair housing point of view, from a mobility point of view, that this ought to be one of the easier issues to deal with. Yet for uh, a long, long time, uh, there hasn't been any movement inside of HUD. So that I'm really pessimistic about bringing about significant change without taking some strong action. Uh, this is Phil, and I'll, I'll add a little technical note to Alex's uh, points, which I agree with. Um, while we're waiting for the uh, uh, implementation of small area FMRs nationwide, hopefully after the small area FMR demonstration is completed in a year, uh, there is a, uh, a way of partially implementing small area FMRs uh, today. Uh, and that is, in, in October of every year, HUD publishes uh, the uh, annual FMRs for the, for the upcoming year. And in that publication for the last couple of years, HUD has also been listing the small area FMRs just as an FYI. And they have indicated that uh, public housing agencies can use those small area FMRs to request payment standards of, 100, of up to 120% of the FMR. Um, and so uh, if there are specific sub-areas of your region uh, that uh, uh, where the small area FMRs indicate a, a much higher rent is needed, you can use that data in the October Federal Register issue to, uh, uh, your public housing agency, I should say, can use that to request the higher payment standards. Now, at the same time, it's important, uh, I think, for PHAs uh, to uh, not be overpaying uh, in uh, the uh, lower rent areas. And, and uh, you know, folks should be trying to perhaps uh, get payment standards lowered in some of those lower rent areas, um, in part because the uh, many PHAs, at least none in this room, but uh, many PHAs don't do as well uh, on uh, enforcing rent reasonableness rules in the uh, higher poverty areas as they should. And so lowering payment standards is another approach to addressing that problem. So it's a two-way issue about, about uh, what the payment standards should be and how to start applying small area FMRs uh, now. If I may just add, um, this is, um, the, the other approach, of course, is to expand moving to work, which I think accomplishes two things. One is it moves the, uh, the impetus for actually creating the structure down to the local level where I think it can be done um, much more quickly than we've seen in the, uh, the HUD uh, small areas pilot has been going on now for I think five years, six years, something like that, and uh, is still a year from conclusion. Uh, and will no doubt come up with a new set of um, problems in terms of implementation. Uh, the second is that to the degree in moving to work, you are essentially giving a fixed pot of money to the housing authority and incenting them to use it wisely. Uh, the motivations are there for the housing authority, not to be leading the market in terms of poor rent reasonableness or overpaying in lower market areas. And finally, though, I think Phil's point is a good one. We found that 120% of that how more people do it for us, and that if we're serious about getting folks uh, into those parts of the region that are truly high and very high opportunity zones, uh, we needed to be above that. Um, this is Chris, if further, I could... Oh, oh. I, I was just going to add a further uh, strategy, and that's <clears throat> one that the public housing authorities in the Baltimore region have just taken, which is uh, to, to join together. They've been trying to work together to eliminate some of these barriers um, Per, and meeting pursuant to our Sustainable Communities Initiative uh, grant. And so they have uh, joined together to submit a joint request that covers all of their jurisdictions and requests uh, exception payment standards that mirror those of the mobility program and so go up to 130% of, of uh, FMR. So that's something that um, PHAs in, in other regions could emulate. And that's pending before HUD now, so we'll let you know the results of that. And, and this is Chris. I just have uh, Chris Klepper from Chicago. Um, <clears throat> there, there is a housing authority in our region uh, who set um, payment standards uh, by opportunity area and non-opportunity area. Um, they did this on their own. 
they it, that, that doesn't you know deal with the exception rent question but it does deal with the smaller area setting the fair market rent. It was even done by census tract within communities, um, and it was tied to an opportunity area versus a non-opportunity area. Um, and I really thought it was a better way to do it than the small area FMR, because the small area FMR is based on zip codes. And the method they used, um, I thought it was it was so progressive and um, such a good idea, and it worked very well. Now they're part of the small area FMR pilot, so they had to abandon the old way they were doing it, and they are using the zip codes now. Um, but I really thought the way they did it. <clears throat> Uh, tied to opportunity areas versus non-opportunity areas, and based on reality comparables, um, was really an excellent way to do it. And I would like to see that method expanded. Great, thanks so much. So moving along, uh, we have just a couple more questions, um, just very quickly. Um, so a question for uh, Steve Norman. Uh, uh, Kevin Nestor, I uh, was wondering if you could illustrate more about workforce housing. Uh, how does workforce housing differ from other forms of housing, and how do you see it as more effective? Well, uh, workforce housing is essentially targeting folks who are generally in about the 40 to 60 percent of AMI range. And what we're able to do is we purchase um, generally 100 unit plus um, what we call Woody Work walk-ups, Class B multifamily in opportunity neighborhoods. Uh, we do that through a variety of um, financing mechanisms involving, in some cases, tax credits, which put a hard cap of 60% of AMI on affordability, but in other cases, just simply straight bonds, sometimes uh, local soft dollars to make up an equity contribution. Uh, the folks who live there uh, are not getting a, uh, a federal rental subsidy. They are paying the rent out of their own pocket. That being said, there is an ability to project base on that site, Section 8 vouchers, which would create, in essence, um, deeply affordable units to very low-income families paying 30 percent of their, of their income. And it also gets around uh, the ongoing problem, even with source of income discrimination, of landlords not being particularly interested in voucher holders. So we have a critical mass of about 5,000 of these units around the county now, and it provides us with both the balance sheet that gives us access to additional capital uh, and the ability to essentially move subsidies around into areas that we think most benefit extremely low-income households. Okay. Well, thanks so much. So um, we actually have uh, two more questions, um, just quickly here. First is, uh, are there any studies, this is from Ryan Downer, who asks, are there any studies yet on how children in the Thompson and Gautreau families are actually doing in terms of educational outcomes? answer for the Thompson program and the, <clears throat> the answer is that there is one in, uh, in the works. Um, Stephanie DeLuca is matching um, the individual data on student uh, participants in the mobility program uh, with a comparison group of kids from um, the, the schools that serve the neighborhoods where those families originated before they made a mobility move and then is going to be then is tracking them longitudinally um, and their performance after they move so uh, that is somewhat of a longitudinal study that's been in the works for uh, some time um, and uh, I think they're She's nearing the point where she'll have some preliminary results coming out over the next year or so. Um, this is Chris again. I would just say uh, Crossing the Class and Color Lines, the book that I referenced during my presentation, that is a study of the Gautreau families, including the children, and the um, educational outcomes that they achieved, and they compared uh, the families that moved to white suburbia to uh, families who stayed in the city. Um, so, uh, and I'm sure you can find something online so you don't have to read the whole book, but um, it's actually a very good book, so I would recommend it. 
Okay, great. We just have one final question here. Um, does the HVCP also pose op obstacles to seeking higher opportunity areas in the way that reimbursement occurs according to number of vouchers issued or administered by a program? I think the, the bottom line problem we have to date is that uh, we are not getting sufficient funding from HUD to sustain the vouchers we have. Mm. And that that makes for hard choices in terms of uh, looking to be aggressive on raising payment standards because in some cases um, you would be actually shrinking the size of the program to accommodate that and uh, no housing authority in the country wants to reduce the number of households it's serving. So the, the key issue for Congress, particularly in this coming session, um, is whether we are going to even hold our own, much less gain back some of the 80,000 vouchers we've lost due to sequestration. And this is uh, can I just add, to, can I, this is Barbara, can I just add to that that, that one of the things that, that we found in Baltimore was that the, although the higher payment standards uh, increase the leasing costs to a, to a certain extent, um, the costs are actually more driven by family size than they are by the payment standards. And so um, in, in our program, <clears throat> you actually see higher costs, not so much because families are moving to opportunity areas, but because we're serving families with children in uh, predominantly three-bedroom or larger units where the um, voucher programs in, in um, the jurisdictions uh, where we operate serve a much higher percentage of one-bedroom households. So these um, issues of cost trade-offs are not really uh, unique or particular to um, the question of mobility or not mobility, opportunity or not opportunity, uh, they're just I I issues inherent in the way that the voucher program is funded and shouldn't really be a reason for not implementing a mobility program. Okay, I'm so very thankful for all the presenters as well as the attendees who have hung on. It is about five or six minutes after four. Thank you so very much. Uh, we will make this PowerPoint available and um, post it on you know, the respective websites as well. Look forward next year to another webinar on other types of strategies to, uh, that our members deal with as far as housing choice. Thank you once again. <laughs>